But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee, of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken, as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Send out your light and your truth, O Lord. Let them lead us. Let them bring us to your holy hill. And to your dwelling place. Amen. A concept we learned from our sister congregation in North Carolina and merged or integrated into our ministry here is counter predictable. Our ministry here at Covenant of Grace should frequently surprise people. What a church should be and do isn't what many people have come to expect. If we're faithful in our calling as a congregation, the ways that we love God and our neighbor, they should manifest in ways that challenge expectations. As believers, we too should be counter-predictable. Unbelievers have this mental image of what a Christian is like. But by abiding in Christ, we're more Christ-like than that. They think they know what Christianity is, but the way we live our lives should challenge those assumptions. We're more thankful, more joyful, and freer than they would ever have predicted. This counter-predictable approach isn't because our goal is to be contrarians or creative or rebels. It's because, as Jake prayed, our goal is to be faithful. And this counter-predictable initiative, it starts at the top. We serve a counter-predictable God. Like all people, we bring our own expectations into every encounter we have with God. We know what we would do if we were God. And then through skepticism, or fear, or disappointment, or shame, we project and predict what will unfold in history and what will happen in each situation in our lives. We think we have God figured out. But if we find out who God is from Scripture rather than from our feelings and our fears, what we will find is not what we predicted. There are at least three such subversions, counter-predictable elements in this morning's passage. And what they should have provoked in Judah and should provoke in us are a series of counter-predictable responses as well. Now, the first two are about our assessment of our own circumstances, how they should be understood is not what we expect. This is first because our trials are not as bad as we think. Now look at verse 1. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. And verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Now, we've got to unpack this a bit, because if you remember your history, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Judah and Israel had been through trials and hardships before, but nothing like what was about to take place. 
In just a few years, the judgment Isaiah prophesied will come to pass. Jerusalem itself will be captured. The temple will be destroyed. And the entire visible religion of Judaism shattered. Just recently, Judah was prospering. Her people were wealthy and healthy and happy. And even in the dark times that had come before that, the trials were small in comparison to what God will now do in the exile. So how in the world can the prophet of God look at what's about to take place and say that there will be no gloom and that the people have seen a great light? How can he say that what's coming is better than what has come before? The answer lies in the fact that this warning And this judgment come with a promise, not just of restoration, but of an everlasting kingdom of justice and righteousness. This trial, significant and difficult as it will be in the life of God's people, is revealed to be an essential working out of the Father's plan to save. One pastor analogized, he said, you know, a man can drown in a small stream. And yet, even if he had fallen into the whole wide open ocean, but there's a plank to take hold of, he might be rescued and brought to shore. Which is worse, a small trial with no evidence of purpose and no hope of restoration, or a significant fiery trial that is connected to an unbreakable promise of God. Which kind of church would you rather be? A church that by the world's standards is majestic and cannot fail. Or a church that by God's standards is faithful and the spirit of God is with it. The answer is counter predictable. Our condition in times of trial isn't determined by the magnitude of our circumstances. It's guided by the confidence we have in God's promises. What Judah would experience would bring forward God's plan to save his people forever in Christ. What we experience reveals God's plan to make us more like Christ and more ready for the day of his coming. None of us want to suffer. But consider the choice, not as the world sees it, but as it is presented here by God. You can have circumstances in which God is not with you and you are not being sanctified and prepared for the promised glory. But they might be comfortable. Or your life can be a crucible through which God, through all kinds of events, makes you worthy of the kingdom into which he delivers you by his power. And that's how Judah was called to understand what would happen next. Well, we have the strength of faith to view our trials that way as well. The second subversion in the text is also about circumstances, but it's the other side of the coin. God's favor is far more expansive than we ever would have predicted. Isaiah says in verse 3, You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. Again, this comparison is superficially strange. It doesn't make any sense to human eyes and ears. Now, Israel, Judah, was growing. They were prosperous, and they were often successful militarily. Returning from the Babylonian captivity, they would be but a tiny remnant, a fraction of what they were before. How can God look at that remnant, that fractional nation of the future, and say that he has multiplied the nation? How can he compare that people with these people favorably? As often is the case, Here, God's people have set our sights too low. Do you remember when we studied Haggai a few months ago 
And we heard the prophet make a similar kind of comparison, a counterpredictable assertion. His was about the temple. Despite its dimensions and appearances, so much less that the men, the old man who had seen both temples wept when the new temple was completed. And yet despite what their eyes saw, Haggai said the glory of this new temple would be greater than the glory of the first one. How could he say such a thing? How can Isaiah here say that the returning remnant would be a multiplication of the mighty kingdom that had gone into exile? They could say these things because both were looking through what stood before their eyes and to what God said those things represent. Again in verse 1, in the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he's made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Another pastor writes, God came to his people first where they had suffered the most. And from that place, he launched the salvation of the world. Zebulun and Nephthali would be the epicenter of God's judgment on his unbelieving people. But as the author concludes, God turned invasion into mission by making the people of Galilee the first ones to see the light of Jesus. What makes sense? What fits our expectation? Is that God would send his judgment into these places. His people were rebelling against him. They refused to live in the light of his glory and righteousness. They insisted on living by their own strength and pursuing their own objectives and worshiping gods of their own making. What Israel, both kingdoms, experienced at the hands of Syria and Assyria and Babylon in history makes perfect sense to us in that context. What's counterpredictable is not that God's people would suffer such defeat. What's counterpredictable is that God would use that defeat as the launching pad, as an essential element in the unfolding of his plan to save all who would believe. And here the prophet looks beyond these tumultuous events to Christ and not just his first coming in Bethlehem, but his second coming in glory. Matthew quotes these verses in chapter 4 of his gospel saying that they're fulfilled in the earthly ministry of Christ. God will protect his remnant in captivity and in exile. And God will return them to the promised land. While far fewer than were carried away, God's people in this return are more glorious than they ever were before. Why? Because through them, through this remnant, God establishes his church, capital C, the expansive kingdom of the people of Christ. I love what one teacher wrote about this turn of events. He says, they deserved what happened to them. But God was not satisfied with what they deserved. In his zeal, he brought a savior. It was the triumph of God's grace over our depressing failures. And that is joy unspeakable and glory forever. Christians, take comfort. God's favor for the future of his people is far more expansive than we would ever predict. This future comes to pass through the third counterpredictable element of the passage. That God sends a baby not a bully. Verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder of the increase of his government and of peace. There will be no end. How will God respond to the bullying pride of the world? Syria, Assyria, even the wicked unbelief within Israel through what future event will God bring an end to the raging of the nations, the peoples plotting in vain, and the kings of earth setting themselves against the Lord and his anointed? How will God respond to this 
prideful, boastful, aggressive bullying. For to us, a child is born. You see, God will not bring a more powerful version of the same forces that oppose him through which to liberate his people. His means of salvation will be as counterpredictable as are divinely possible. He has more power than his enemies, to be sure. But he does not display this power by one-upping the forces of evil on their own terms. He displays his power by humbling himself to take on human flesh, by taking on our weakness and our vulnerability, by taking his enemies and by grace making them friends. How God works is not how we ever would have predicted. And yet, as we grow in God's word, we learn that this is who God is. And as we grow by grace, we come to expect and even delight in seeing God do what we never would have imagined. Kids, do you remember the story of Gideon? The Midianites, these wicked people, were being used by God to show God's people how wicked they were being. And so God set up the Midianites to be able to come in and steal all of the crops and the livestock, all of their sources of food. And the people of Israel were suffering greatly. And finally, after they had suffered for, in their minds long enough, they finally call out to God for help. And God hears them. And he sends an angel to Gideon to tell him that God is with Gideon. And therefore, he is a mighty man who will be used to save Israel. But Gideon protested. He said, my family is the weakest in all of Israel, and I am the weakest of my whole family. And of course, what we'd learn in the rest of the story is that's exactly why God picked him. Gideon starts with an army of 32,000 people. But counterpredictably, as the army prepares to meet the Midianites, God shrinks the army down to 10,000. And then as the time for the battle draws near, he shrinks the army again down to 300. What is God doing? And then by his power, the cleverness of his divine purpose, those 300 would see 120,000 troops fall and the other 15,000 run away in fear of God. And here, as Syria and Israel rage against Judah, as the larger Assyrian threat looms in the distance, God reminds them of the story of Gideon. He says, that ain't nothing. Verse 4, for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Remember Midian, my people. And that was nothing. Because through Christ, God will not only break the yoke of all earthly oppressors, he will liberate his people forever from Satan and from sin and from death. Through this great conflict, God will put an end to all conflict. Verse 5, every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. Toss your battle gear into the fire, friends. Because when God is done working out his purposes, we won't need this stuff anymore. Not just against the oppressors of war in the world. But against conflict in our relationships. Against the selfishness and pride that we use to hurt one another. Against the disappointment and brokenness that we experience in a fallen world We won't need our defenses against that stuff anymore. And do notice that in verses 4 through 7, there is nothing for you to do. 
The emphasis is entirely on God's work and his purposes. This passage of a blessed future isn't a series of instructions for how Christians can pick themselves up by their bootstraps and win the victory. Our religion isn't one where we offer God enough good to merit him finishing the job for us. Our religion, in defiance of the world's expectations, is one where God has utterly done the work for us. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. It's amazing. And how will he do this? Our enemies, his enemies, those who enslave his people in sin and guilt and shame and death, how will they be dealt with? Not by a mighty bully, but by a baby. For unto us a child is born. Another pastor puts it this way, God's answer to everything that has ever terrorized us is a child. His answer to the bullies swaggering throughout history is not to become an even bigger bully. His answer is Jesus. And it's in the person of Christ, in Isaiah's description of him here, that I think we find the impetus for our counterpredictable response to all of this. Jesus is the God-man. Fully man, a child is born. And fully God, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So to borrow that great phrase from the late Francis Schaeffer, how should we then live? It cannot be the case that children of a counterpredictable God would live exactly as the world expects. God is subversive in his salvation. His work, not ours. Freedom, not slavery. Faith, not works. And a subversive salvation cannot result in a religion that looks like something humans would come up with on their own. As you ponder your own counterpredictable response, I have a couple of suggestions for you as a starting place. First, Count it all joy. God, through Isaiah, directs our gaze always to the end, the return of Jesus. He will preserve his people until and through that time. And everything God is doing in time, even the things that are very hard for us, it all points forward to that day. It all has a joyful purpose and end. What he's done for us already, he says, is to free us from the yoke and the staff and the rod of this world, enabling us to rejoice in all circumstances simply because we are free. I don't minimize our suffering in this life. I hope you never hear me do that. We encounter great, fiery trials, heartbreaking events and difficulties. But we do encounter this every single time as people who are now and forever free from sin and from death. Sin from slavery to Satan and his ways. People who have the certain hope of Christ. Our trials are surely trying. But each is accompanied by a promise that whatsoever comes to pass is for our good and his glory. Even our sufferings have good purposes beyond our predicting. And we persevere through them, confident in the promise that his kingdom is our home. We live in the light of his word. Contrary to the expectations of the world, the scripture is not an oppressive list of don'ts. The more we dig into the scripture, the more we find God's revelation of himself. We find his promises. We find words of comfort and of forgiveness. Why? Because he is the wonderful counselor. 
wonderful counselor. His wisdom is perfect and complete, and he shares that wisdom with us. And he does this, as we learn from the Gospel of John, not as one lectures his servants, but as one encourages his friends. One teacher wrote, if his name is wonderful, then there will be nothing dull about his reign. As counselor, he has the wisdom to rule justly, and as the mighty God, he has the power to execute his wise plans. Another said, if we will live by faith in him now, accepting his weakness as our strength and his folly as our wisdom, we will be there to enjoy his triumph, forever ascending, forever enlarging, forever accelerating, forever intensifying. Christians, there will never be one moment where we can say, this is the limit. He can't think of anything new. We've seen it all. No, the finite will experience ever and ever more wonderfully infinite and every new moment greater than the last. Live joyfully. Brothers and sisters, live joyfully and live in the peace of the Prince of Peace because the Son was given. The government is upon his shoulder and of its increase and justice and righteousness, there shall be no end.